hello everyone this is hepsiba your host for the session today and on behalf of the inclusive city center at the national institute of urban affairs i welcome everyone to the second lecture under the inclusive development lecture series we are over, overwhelmed with the positive feedback received for the first lecture your active participation in the lecture series uh, is welcome and uh, for the session today we are joined by dr kostav bandopadhyay uh, welcome dr kostav uh, i would also like to introduce dr kostav uh, for our audience present today uh, dr kostav bandopadhyay is currently working as the director at participation research in asia priya and priya international academy he has over 25 years of professional experience with university research institution and civil society organizations he has led and managed domestic and international research and action learning projects on citizen participation social accountability civil society development and democratic governance in urban and rural contexts dr kostov has in extensively worked on capacity building projects with particular emphasis on participatory learning monitoring and evaluation organization development strategic planning and participatory training methodology today dr kostov will be speaking on creating avenues for citizen participation participatory planning and social inclusion as we know that sdg's concept of leaving no one behind essentially captures the desire to ensure people are central to governance and services sdgs also demonstrate the factors that largely illustrate social exclusion especially talking about poverty gender equality and reducing inequalities as urban governance aims to create facilities and services uh, for ending extreme poverty it is also vital to take into consideration the voice and agency of listening and responding to the voices of those who are left fathers behind such as people with disabilities children older people and those who face discrimination participatory planning and the role of being accountable through designing policies and building inclusive institutions that address is essential often cities face challenges such as overcrowding wastelands and other such uh, challenges but cities also provide great opportunities in terms of how abandoned buildings and unused spaces can be maintained and managed by local administrators from a social inclusive lens the opportunities hidden in accommodating the will ideas could help administrators to improve these unused spaces so today's lecture focuses upon principles of participatory planning with an approach to make urban planning more community driven blending local context knowledge and work at the neighborhood scale sharing and exploring some frameworks tools and techniques to extensively incorporate this exercise that employs a citizen driven work plan developed in collaboration with various local partners on that note i would like to hand it to dr kostov to share more on the subject over to you dr kostov thank you so much thank you so much uh, hepsiba uh, and thank you for inviting me uh, in this lecture series organized by niua um it's, re it's really an honor and uh, i take all the pleasure of talking to all of you um what i'm going to do today is to uh, structure my presentation in uh, five six components uh, first of all i would like to start with uh, a history of participation and how participation has evolved um, in india as well as uh, in other developing uh, countries and from there we would like to uh, define what we mean by uh, participation and then uh, i'll deal with two uh, areas of participation one um, is the institutional space provided by uh, the government and some of the spaces which have been created by the civil society groups by citizen association and given the new thrust on um, 
technology, particularly information technology. Uh, what I will do, I'll, I'll share a part of our research findings where we uh, try to explore uh, how far online citizen participation can be uh, institutionalized and what are the sort of enabling and, and the factors that we must keep in mind uh, while promoting online uh, citizen participation. And towards the end, I would like to draw um, a couple of key lessons uh, that might be uh, useful in, in terms of institutionalizing uh, citizen participation in urban planning and governance uh, processes. I have a couple of slides to share. So as uh, we have been um, uh, talking about citizen participation, very quickly, uh, let me give you an overview of how uh, participation, um, whether it is in the rural areas or in the urban areas, um, has evolved over the period of time. And if you look at uh, in, in early 60s uh, or throughout 60s, uh, a lot of participation happened uh, at the at the level of uh, at the level of people where the focus was to uh, become self-reliant um, and this was influenced in a sense by the Gandhian ideas of self-reliant community and therefore voluntary participation in the development programs uh, or developmental activities whether in the villages or in the or in the uh, towns and cities, the focus was more to contribute to the society. That was the beginning of uh, understanding of participation. And towards the 70s and 80s, if you recall, a lot of social movements and environmental movements started happening around the issues of access to and control over natural resources whether it is forest, whether it is water, whether it is access to land, um, all these peasant movements, uh, environmental movements started happening. And those movements in a way created spaces for citizen engagement and citizen participation uh, there. Um, and as we move to, um, let's say late eighties, early nineties, um, a lot of developmental programs, particularly programs which were supported by the international development agencies, uh, whether it is bilateral agencies or multilateral agencies, uh, they mandated citizen participation as an inbuilt component within those development projects. And these um, projects were supported by bilateral and multilateral agencies, but the principal implementing agencies where the national government or the subnational government. And if you recall the, uh, let's say education program or, or watershed program, irrigation program, uh, forestry program, in all these programs, um, it, it was thought that, um, you know, if people participate in the designing of this program, planning uh, of this program, there will be better ownership. So ownership from the national government or from the state government uh, or, or from the local authorities, uh, the intention was to transfer that ownership to the people. And therefore, um, many beneficiary communities or users communities um, were formed. And those became the vehicle for promoting uh, people's participation, citizen participation. And people's, people were seen as the, uh, development manager at the, at the local level. So they will manage their own development program. Um, and then um, this, this was particularly the case, uh, the way uh, different bilateral and multilateral agencies started defining what is participation. And then uh, it was the World Bank who came up with a comprehensive uh, definition of participation, but there, the problematic in that definition was that it was too open, too wide, 
for everyone. Uh, whereas the earlier focus on the participation was hitherto excluded people. So those who are marginalized, those who are uh, not able to participate, creating spaces for their participation, that was the intention of many of these developmental projects. But uh, in this case, the World Bank started opening up the definition and then many civil society groups and development practitioners, they brought back the concept of the primary stakeholders, which means those who will be primarily affected by a development uh, program. So their participation starting from the part, uh, planning to implementation, to monitoring and evaluation. So in that project cycle, uh, it was considered uh, important uh, that primary stakeholders take ownership and, and manage those development programs at the local level. And then it was a watershed moment uh, in India, early, early 90s, particularly in 1992, 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments were brought in, 73rd for the rural governance, what is known as Panchayati Raj Institution. And then um, in, and the 74th constitutional amendment was applicable to the urban uh, areas. Now, it was not only in India, but also almost like 80 countries uh, between um, early 90s to 2000, uh, in a way implemented, enacted and implemented some form of decentralization of governance systems. And therefore, a lot of planning exercises were taken at the local level uh, in, in close uh, proximity to, to the people where they live. Um, and and uh, in our, our uh, constitutions, particularly two provisions, um, Gram Sabhas in, in rural areas and ward committees in, in urban areas were thought to be a space for direct participation, direct democracy, and, and people's involvement in the local development planning. So uh, in a way, uh, in 70s, 80s, uh, until till, uh, late 80s, participation was seen in the project. And it was, in a way, graduated from project to governance. Uh, and it was a kind of transformative journey as far as the concept and practice of participation uh, is concerned. And those who have been promoting participation were, were quite excited to see the uh, progression with which uh, new spaces have been created through this constitutional uh, amendment. But very soon, uh, the civil society groups, citizens associations uh, have also realized that the, uh, in, the, in the discourse on good governance, uh, transparency and accountability of the elected representatives across levels, but particularly at the local level, was of utmost importance if participation has to be promoted. And, and citizens' rights um, to development, right to, right to other, other, other uh, resources were seen as integral to local democracy and, and local development. And therefore, a, a lot of civil society movements started um, and they have been using a lot of social accountability approaches to promote um, participation, but participation was more, um, and, and, and they realized that unless um, there is demonstrated accountability and, and transparency from the local governance institution, participation might not uh, be that effective. So that's how the trajectories have, you know, has, has evolved uh, over, over, the, over the period. Now, um, uh, the question is always that, what do we mean uh, by participation? Uh, in the early days, uh, if you recall, uh, when development was seen uh, as, as basic need, uh, and, and many uh, international agencies, particularly the multilateral agencies like ILO, uh, World Bank, uh, they took a basic need approach, which means an access to health services, all these were seen as basic needs. 
and um, the the priority of the development was how uh, the external agencies, whether it is international agencies or the national government uh, or governmental agencies, how they can ensure access to certain basic needs, uh, which are essential for people's survival. Um, and then uh, parallelly, when we are talking about uh, people's involvement, people's participation, Wohen uh, and Aphop, they came up with this concept that participation itself is a basic need. And this idea came out of the discussion um, and, and a kind of huge debate around whether participation itself is a, is a, is a means or uh, it's an end. Um, so, so according to Kohen and Aphop, many civil society groups thought that participation in itself, uh, it, it's not an aim, but it, uh, it, it's not a means, but it's, it's an, an, an end in itself. So therefore, uh, all, the, all the outcomes that you want to see in the development programs, um, participatory development assumed um, a, a cornerstone in the discourse on, on participation. But then, um, you know, uh, uh, Nabatachi and, and uh, Leininger, uh, they gave a very uh, simple uh, definition of participation. And I like this definition uh, for some reasons. Um, they say that um, participation is an umbrella term uh, that describes the activities by which people's concerns, needs, interests, and values are incorporated into the decisions and actions on public matters and issues. Um, you know, here, uh, they, they were silent about uh, one thing that who is the initiator of this participation, whether it's government or it is non-governmental initiatives, but the essential focus was that participation is incomplete unless there is an involvement and stake in the decisions and actions which affect the public matters. Therefore, uh, my participation is important because uh, by, by participating, I will be influencing the decision-making process, uh, which, which would affect my life, my, my survival. And therefore, uh, this focus on decision and actions on public matters um, is, is uh, critically, critically important. Now, if you look at the types of participation that has uh, been conceptualized over the over the years. One conceptualization was done by John Gaventa and others in uh, Institute for Development uh, Studies, uh, where they talked about uh, two kinds of spaces. Uh, one is invited spaces, and another was invented or creative spaces. The invited spaces are those spaces where the public officials invite citizens for sharing ideas, opinions, and their, their, uh, to know their aspiration with an objective to uh, develop a program or, or plan a program. So, so um, all these, all these um, exercises by different ministries uh, to invite people, uh, their ideas and their, their feedback on certain policies or certain programs uh, are seen as uh, invited spaces. So someone is inviting me to participate uh, in their program and with the hope that at some point in time that ownership will be transferred to the participants as well. So one, one is that. And second was that uh, although um, invited spaces create, um, create, create institutional opportunity, but many a times um, a lot of people get excluded. Uh, in the beginning, you talked about um, uh, leave no one behind. Huh? But unfortunately, in the development process, certain groups uh, are always uh, left behind. And, and therefore, they are in order to make sure their participation, um, many a times, civil society groups, citizen associations, they themselves have created spaces to uh, you know, communicate their voices uh, and, and their aspiration. Uh, and, and it's a kind of, um, you know, interactive space where uh, invited spaces are there, but the created and, in, and, and invented spaces from the citizens or citizen associations 
they interact with the invent, invited spaces. So one classification or one type of understanding on participation is based on the who initiates participation. So that's, uh, that's the first part. The second part is uh, types of participation based on uh, mechanism. Uh, and mechanisms in a sense, uh, it's both mechanisms and also the degree of participation or degree of the uh, rigorness in, 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 the, in the participation process. So one, one is of course conventional participation, which is basically an older forms of engagement where uh, everything is planned, um, you know what to ask, you know what to share, uh, and it's very orderly uh, participation. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort on part of the uh, public officials to demonstrate downward vertical accountability to the citizens. Um, and, and, and in order to invoke participation from the citizens, of course, the public officials need to share certain kind of information in a transparent manner. Uh, a typical example is town hall meeting. Uh, and town hall meeting, um, uh, you know, the, the organizers should decide who should be invited in this uh, meeting. They would decide the agenda. They would decide what to discuss, how much to discuss, what to share, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the, uh, the major responsibility uh, lies with the uh, public officials. Um, that's the conventional way of participation. And then there is another concept called <clears throat> thin participation. Normally, um, and I will I'll sort of you know, give more examples where as, we, as we go through this uh, uh, talk, um, the thin participation is where uh, there, is, there is no expectation in changing the power relationship between who initiates participation and who participates. The idea is, um, you know, uh, get some opinions, get some uh, ideas from a large number of citizens, um, and and there are there are different ways to do, do it. You know, sometimes <clears throat> even citizens' association they start signing petition. So and 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 inviting other citizens, other fellow citizens to support the cause. Um, but but the numbers. Are, are critically important in this kind of uh, participation um, or, or filling out a survey. You know? um, some ministry sends a form and asks, uh, you know, what are your priorities? Um, uh, what, should be, what should be the priorities of the uh, ministry? Tell us, uh, we want to hear you uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and many a times, you know, these days, uh, social media platforms are used uh, to, to um, you know, invite participation, but 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 um, there uh, the idea is not to go back to the original de uh, definition of participation, where we talk about participation in decision making process. Um, the, the the participation in decision making process requires uh, a tremendous amount of power shift, uh, and the expectation from team participation is not to disturb the. Uh, the current sort of you know uh, uh, power relationship uh, between the initiators and the invitee, but uh, still uh, we'd be able to uh, get opinions and ideas from from the citizens. And then the concept of thick participation. The uh, thick participation uh, is still uh, a large number of people participate, but uh, perhaps they would be uh, working in smaller groups. Uh, to, to, to learn, to decide, and to act. And there, the expectation uh, is much more as compared to the conventional participation or, or team participation. There, the expectation is that uh, participation seen as a learning process. And, and therefore, any behavioral change um, in, in, in terms of you know, acting on decisions uh, are in a way facilitated. Uh, through this thick participation process. Uh, and if you look, look at, um, you know, all those committees are formed, the regular committee meetings, then going back to the citizens, uh, asking for their opinion, uh, bringing them into the decision-making process, all these are expectations from the uh, thick participation. So, so far what we have covered is the journey of participa 
participation as a concept and practice. And from that journey, uh, different sort of understanding of participation has evolved uh, over, over the period. Uh, now, a good part is that um, we have a much more richer understanding uh, about participation today as compared to when uh, the journey began. And therefore, uh, a, a lot of practices coexist. Um, and, and, and um, you know, thin participation, thick participation, conventional participation, they all coexist. And a single mode of participation might not uh, be enough to, to, to create uh, a, a transformatory uh, space. Now look at um, how uh, in, in urban India, um, these invited spaces have been uh, created. And one of, the, one of the most significant space, spaces has been created through the constitutional amendment as part of 74th constitutional amendment. Um, uh, without going into the major details of this provision, uh, let's acknowledge the fact that um, 74th Constitutional Amendment Act talked about uh, the formation, uh, constitution and composition of world committees. And it's, it suggests there shall be constituted world committees consisting of one or more words within the territorial area of a municipality having a population of 300,000 or more. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a revolutionary uh, provision, but uh, there are sort of two, two issues uh, in the definition in itself. Uh, one is that if you look at the, uh, in most of the metro cities or mega cities, the size of the world is so huge. Um, and on top of that, when you talk about uh, formation of ward committee in more than one hours, uh, many times we are we are talking about hundreds and thousands of um, and, and and you know uh, people coming together and 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 being part of the world committee or or at least the representation by the world committees for these thousand hundreds and thousands of people. So therefore, um, the granularity of the participation is lost uh, when you try to cover a large area by uh, saying that either it would be. Uh, constituted in one word, or, or you can also think about more than one word, uh, number one. <clears throat> the second one is the restriction on the size uh, of the population. And size of the population here um, talked about 300,000, but if you look at out of uh, these 4,000 plus statutory uh, towns, uh, a large number of uh, statutory towns uh, would be would be less than uh, the population in those in those towns would be less than three hundred thousand, and therefore uh, many municipal councils and nagar panchayats are excluded because of the site restriction. And now it, it throws a question that why uh, such a such a large number of statutory uh, municipalities would be excluded uh, or or not having the opportunity. <clears throat> To, to, for, uh, uh, to invite citizens to participate in the planning process or, or in, in development and programs. Um, the, the other thing that um, this article 4, 243S uh, also suggests is that nothing in this article shall be deemed uh, to prevent the legislature of a state from making any provisions of the constitution of committees in addition to the world committees. And perhaps that had opened up the opportunity to think about uh, a, a new community participation law uh, under Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. And a model uh, Nagar Rajya Bill or community participation law was proposed as one of the reforms under JNNU uh, sometimes in 2000, 2005, 2006. And along the line of Gram Sabhas, um, it suggested uh, well, provisions for area shall. And area sabhas uh, will be constituted uh, by all the electorates uh, from a polling booth. Um, and then uh, it also talked about world committees, uh, basically representing the elected area sabha representatives um, and, and members from the civil society groups. Uh, and, and ward councillor was 
uh, suggested as uh, the chairperson of the of the world committees. Um, but unfortunately, the compliance um, by the state governments uh, and then by by the municipalities have been um, abysmal uh, to to say the, say the least. Um, most of the most of the uh, state governments, like twelve to fourteen states, have uh, uh, in a way enacted this act, but uh, very few of them have actually implemented uh, the act. Uh, notwithstanding that non-implementation, uh, one of the critics of this area of and what what committees was that there was no provision for. Uh, let's say migrants or other occupational groups um, to be eligible to participation um, through area sabas and what sabas. And this is important because um, a lot of migrants, uh, those who are residing uh, in, the, in the world or in a locality within the world, um, they have a lot of states. They have a lot of states. But just because their names are not enrolled under the electoral roll, uh, on the electoral roll, uh, they, will, they would not be uh, eligible to become a member of the area of and Warsaw. Similarly, um, you know, it's not in a, in a city that the, if, you, if you look at the world as an administrative unit, I might be reciting in ward number A. Um, but my, my business is in ward number B. So I have two kinds of states. One is around my business where I don't live, but I also have states as a residence, um, which is uh, ward number A. Now, I don't have any say on, in the planning process or in, in any affairs um, in the second ward because uh, that's where I am not eligible to be a member of the area of our, our work committees. So, so these are these are the uh, areas where we need to pay a little more attention uh, while implementing uh, uh, these these uh, provisions. And the functions which are suggested to the area of ours and and work committees were local level planning, uh, particularly looking at the spatial planning, social economic and infrastructure development planning. Uh, and also beneficiary identification for uh, for uh, the for various uh, public programs, um, and uh, it was suggested that these committees would have access to uh, all kinds of information, particularly the budget-related information, uh, land use-related uh, uh, information, and uh, access to developmental and zonal planning. Uh, so those kind of information would be provided to the ward committees and the area service. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, that uh, very few states have enacted this community participation law. Uh, some of the some of the issues that we also need to deliberate uh, while uh, pursuing or advocating for the implementation of um, uh, uh, Nagara Raja Bill or community participation law. Um, is that the, the states which have enacted, uh, many a times they have not opted for election. So they have opted for nomination. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, th 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 there's an argument in favor of that as well. But uh, a, a point of deliberation is that whether uh, nomination is the best way to go for uh, constituting area of our representatives um, and, and how far um, the elections can be feasible uh, to, to be conducted um, along with the municipal uh, election. And then the issue of sequencing the constitutions. Now in the Nagara Raja bill, uh, it, was, it was the sequencing was suggested like first area Sabha will be constituted and then the representative from the area Sabha will also be in the world committees. Um, but many times we have seen in a couple of states where they have tried to implement the Watsava has been con constituted first, and then uh, Watsava was entrusted with the responsibility of creating uh, area servers. And um, this sequencing uh, needs to be needs to be 
deliberated upon. And, and also who takes the lead, whether it's the elected councillor or the municipal bureaucrats or, or local civil society groups, uh, that needs to be uh, uh, debated, debated and, and discussed. Uh, also the composition is, a, is, a, uh, uh, is an issue, particularly representation of the women, uh, young people, uh, representation of the urban poor, and as I was talking about the migrants and other marginalized groups, uh, whether they have the space to, um, you know, uh, 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 share their voices uh, in in this in this composition, uh, and what are the rights? And a sense of horizontal accountability is also a point of deliberation. Horizontal accountability, in a sense, uh, many a times the discussion between uh, citizens groups, um, those need to be maintained in a, in a, in a, there has to be some decorum, some procedure, um, and, and around the, the major question is the, um, is the civility in the discussion and, and, and discourse, uh, those need to be, uh, maintained. And, um, as we are discussing that there are invited spaces and there are invi invented spaces. So even if the community through community participation law, area summer becomes an in a, uh, an invite. Is by the by the by the citizens or circle groups or women's group or youth group or youth club. Uh, those are also spaces for participation. Now, how do we bring coherence between this institutionally invited space and the citizens? Uh, invented or created uh, space. Um, and the last point is of critical importance is that how to encourage and hold uh, the governments accountable to the implementation of community participation law. And, and um, there are several implications uh, in terms of even when there was good intention by, by many government programs to involve uh, citizens. And, and in the absence of any, any mechanism like what Sabas, Arya Sabas, or, or, or for that matter, uh, any, other, any other mechanism, um, it was, it was uh, an uneven experience by most of the, most of the government programs. And I will cite a couple of examples. Um, let's say, let's say uh, look, at the, like a, look at the way uh, smart city planning um, tried to involve citizen in the smart city planning process. Um, first of all, it was for the first time um, that the ministry recognized uh, substantively the, the importance and significance of citizen participation. So the hats off to that recognition. Um, and if you recall that you know, out of 100, 30 months uh, were dedicated to uh, demonstrate that um, the, the smart city plan has been prepared in consultation and participation and engagement uh, with, the, with the citizens. But what has happened that engagement was in a way reduced to giving opinions on predetermined choices and projects. You know, we did a study in 10 cities and, and the way sort of participation uh, began uh, is, to, is to propose uh, is, is to share the proposal from the uh, municipality and then asking uh, or, or consulting citizens um, what are the priorities. Uh, but but it, it has to be it has to be much more deeper and open. Uh, it had to start with inviting suggestions from the uh, citizens in terms of their developmental priorities and then from that priorities reprioritization, had, had to be done uh, in, in multiple uh, steps. But because of the time constraints, um, action was restricted only to, uh, you know, um, inviting opinions on the predetermined choices. Uh, technology and social media platforms were heavily used uh, as the primary space for participation. And, and various kind of opinion surveys. Uh, but the problem was that once those opinions were gathered, uh, I think many of them forgot to analyze and, and uh, 
um, you know, going back to the community and telling that this is what we have heard from all of you. And these are the priorities that we are going to set and, and uh, providing that feedback to the, or what do you call closing the feedback loop uh, by, by telling that what you have done with the data that you have collected from, from the citizens. That effort was um, minimal, uh, I would say. And, and uh, the last point is also critically important and it has implications even now that there was hardly any effort to build capacities of the urban local bodies, whether it is uh, the elected representatives or the municipal officials, um, there, was, there was hardly any orientation that how to mobilize citizens or how to facilitate civilian participation. There might be orientation on other technical subjects, but there was hardly any orientation on um, how, to, how to promote civilian participation in the municipal uh, governance and planning process. Um, and this was critical because um, municipalities were, uh, for the first time, they were told to facilitate participation and they didn't have any clue how to, how to uh, you know, facilitate a robust uh, participation. Um, and, and as a result, the process was consulted driven and very short term. Um, and many a times, many citizens have sort of uh, shared with us that it's an extremely uh, disembodied process, particularly where you give opinion, you, you share your ideas, but you don't hear back from the uh, authorities that what needs to, what, what has been done uh, with, with, with that data. That's the, that's the kind of you know example from the smart city planning. Uh, then then come the Swachh Bharat mission. It was a it was a huge call for participation. It was a huge call for participation, and the highest political leaders were talking about um, you know citizen at the center and and Swachh Bharat uh, mission becomes uh, a John Andalan. Um, that kind of you know, vocabulary was used. Those are strong vocabularies and strong uh, signals were sent to the uh, municipalities for inviting uh, citizen participation. But in reality, what happened that um, as we are focusing uh, and, and saying that participation is a learning process and it, therefore it needs to be learned to those who have not participated in, the, in, in these kind of processes, those processes need to be learned. But uh, learning participation was replaced with somehow preaching, you know, how to behave. And therefore, a whole load of effort was on behavioral change communication. Yes, behavioral change communication was required. Uh, but let's not equate behavioral change communication and participation. Um, so so uh, in a sense, what I'm trying to drive um, at is that in the absence of any institutionalized space uh, or, or involving the citizen associations, both in case of smart city planning and in Swachh mission, the efforts were uh, half-hearted. And, and, and although the intention was there, but it was not possible to, to, to practice a robust participatory exercise just because there was no mechanism available. And therefore, Going forward, one has to think about, you know, creating mechanisms which would facilitate this participation. Now, um, on the on the civil society side, if you look at uh, some of the efforts, you know, including organizations like us, um, uh, participatory research in Asia, we have also uh, tried to promote uh, participatory methods in in the participatory planning processes um, and. Um, the, the, they're sort of uh, good examples, but there is also a question of sustainability of these processes. So there the, our, our focus was to uh, come up with some kind of methodology which can be scaled up, institutionalized and practiced by many others. So there we have invested more on building uh, an enabling environment for Citizen participation, as I, and as I have been saying, that um, participation is always a learning process, and therefore, therefore, if we do not create an enabling learning environment, participation might not uh, happen. 
so we, we invested quite a lot in informal consultations across citizens and uh, stakeholders, um, and then interaction and capacity building of municipal officials and elected uh, councillors, because uh, the, ultimately the elected councillors, uh, they have the connection um, and an accountability relationship uh, with, with, the, with the citizens, and therefore their understanding, their concurrence, and their capacity, both are important uh, element in any any planning process. Um, also involving the local civil society groups, uh, not necessarily NGOs, but also a whole lot of other professional groups, uh, self-help groups, women's groups, youth, youth groups, um, their orientation uh, and mapping of those institutions, uh, those organizations and, and orienting them in the process of participatory planning is uh, uh, critical. Um, the, the other thing is the, uh, because it's a learning process, uh, massive city-wide public awareness and education uh, is important, but more so important for the people who are living in the informal settlements where there is always um, uh, a, a lack of, uh, you know, information dissemination or access to information. Uh, and therefore special focus needed to be given to the informal settlements. Um, then we also organized uh, consultations at the zone, zonal level or cluster of awards, um, and then separate consultations with the in, informal settlements. Um, and in the process, um, many new stakeholders were identified and, and the interaction with them uh, was critically, critically important. Um, then two processes, uh, uh, one, one um, Many times, you know, many participatory exercises or, or planning processes claim that they have collected data from the um, citizens and citizens uh, aspirations and needs have been taken into consideration. But one thing that we have found more critical is to engage the citizens in the data collection process itself, not only as a provider of uh, data, um, that I'm interviewing someone and, and the, that person is giving me information and I am the researcher who would be uh, analyzing that data, but it's turning around and treating the citizens as co-researcher in the process. And they are also entitled and they are also empowered to collect data, analyze data and um, you know, uh, co-creating knowledge around which um, you know, the planning and, and prioritization uh, can happen. So a lot of participatory survey methods should be uh, used that, that we have uh, used in the, in, the, in the planning process. Uh, then of course, you know, preparation of uh, maps and ground verification. So there, uh, there is a scope to involve the citizens and stakeholders in verifying because most of the maps, um, many times they, they, are, they, are, they were old maps and therefore, there is a there is a uh, there is a, a gap between uh, what exists on the ground and what is seen on the map, uh, and therefore uh, those verifications are uh, critically important. And and uh, a, a most most critical step is to uh, you know feedback uh, provide feedback to the community that how uh, the co-creation of knowledge have been facilitated and how that knowledge has been used in the, in the planning process. In the plan preparation process, of course, again, uh, you start with the visioning uh, in small stakeholders groups. Um, but before that, since you, 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 we have uh, you know, uh, organized a massive citizen mobilization process, um, the ideas coming from those citizen mobilization uh, were fed into the small stakeholders groups meetings and there you consolidate the data. Um, of course, you know, it's not a single stakeholder exercise, it's a kind of multi-stakeholder exercise. And therefore, identification and elaboration of the projects based on the critical priority sector uh, is, is, is of important. And along with that, some kind of, you know, investment plan uh, was, was sort of prepared for municipalities to uh, consider that, <clears throat> It's not only a wish list of projects and programs, but also there is a concrete financial plan, uh, investment plan, and therefore some 
ideas that from where these resources should be mobilized. So this is how um, you know uh, organization like us uh, have have facilitated uh, participatory planning uh, process. But there are other participatory initiatives by many civil society organizations. And if you look at the um, RWAs or housing society associations, apartment association, um, their uh, issues and concerns are also raised uh, with the municipality. So it's it's less of planning, more of day-to-day -day governance and administration uh, and, and, and service-related issues uh, that, that these, these kind of you know, formations uh, have been facilitating a dialogue between municipalities and, and these kind of groups. But there are also issue-specific interest groups, there are environmental groups, uh, and, and they, they pick up ideas, they identify uh, uh, issues and pick up ideas, and, and then uh, some kind of dialogues are organized. Many civil society organizations have been using uh, many social accountability tools, like citizen report, social audit, uh, scorecard, or citizen charter. Uh, those have been, those have been um, uh, instruments for participation based on evidences and then initiating dialogues with the municipalities. And those data generated through these social accountability tools uh, can be fed into the, the, the planning process. Uh, then uh, many organizations are facilitating organizations of the urban poor, whether it is, um, you know, settlement improvement committees or, or slum federations, uh, particularly with the, with the informal, informal communities. And then, you know, several organizations have been using online tools and platforms um, uh, to, to promote uh, participation. And I'll, I'll sort of, you know, spend uh, a, a bit of time um, on, uh, so uh, on, 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 the, on the issues of online participation. So we did a, we did a study uh, recently and um, um, uh, we came up with this typology of purposes uh, is that, you know, uh, organizations or civil society organizations have been using uh, online platform to, to inform uh, uh, people or uh, providing information. Then some, some organizations were trying to facilitate access to government schemes and uh, uh, programs. Uh, then then uh, others were using online platform for retracer. Others were also using for petitioning, like you know, raising certain issues. Um, and others were uh, crowdsourcing ideas and suggestions for uh, uh, policy making. Now, obviously, there are sort of optimism around online technology because of the ease of participation. It has the scope for scaling up. Uh, it also allows citizens to access the decision makers and so on and so forth. But the contextual barriers are huge. And particularly in our context, the digital divide is a reality. And therefore, uh, you know, not everyone has an equal chance of participating. And therefore, we need to think uh, that how uh, if online participation becomes uh, a mechanism for promoting participation, how we can uh, we can facilitate for others. Uh, there is a training is an issue. Uh, those who will be facilitating must be trained in uh, that. Um, and also, uh, online space is space is also um, seen as uh, you know quite unsafe in a sense. Trolling is there. Different threats are there. And therefore, how do you create um, a more, more uh, uh, safe space? So uh, four principles that we are suggesting uh, in order to make participation work. One is that providing information, adequate, timely, authentic, and usable information uh, to citizens in order to, uh, in order to uh, invite their participation. Uh, active listening. Is, is very important and with the sensitivity and um, uh, if requires um, the using competent facilitator for, for listening what people are uh, saying uh, and what are their aspirations. And, and we need to create safe spaces for uh, voicing out both grievances but such suggestions as well. And there has to be a space for um, uh, forthright deliberation. And, and then the accountability must be uh, ensure in terms of sharing back 
the summaries and results and utilizations of the input received from the uh, uh, from the citizens. Let me conclude uh, uh, by by uh, consolidating some of the lessons uh, which could be useful while we think about you know promoting participation in urban planning uh, and and uh, and and in urban governance. First of all, uh, we make need to make sure that where wherever people have been informed, um, their awareness have been raised, uh, they have been organized, the results have been better. And therefore, informed, aware, organized citizens uh, are key in, in promoting uh, participation. Second is that using planning process as a civic education, citizenship education process, uh, providing information, deliberation, discussion, all these are citizenship education and, and uh, creating space for people to uh, you know, share their voices and also uh, share their what are their choices. Uh, so that, that would definitely be required. Then uh, there's sort of two point connect, connected point. One is citizens uh, with access to universalized institutional spaces like ward committees and, and area servers where anybody can be member of that. But at the same time, we also need to create particular right spaces for the excluded and marginalized. And then unless we also create a particular right space, their participation will not be mainstream in the universalized space. And, there, and the last point is that enhancing capacities of urban local bodies on citizen participation. So the key lesson here is that when we we'll be able to instill confidence in citizens that they are part of the decision making, uh, then citizen participation becomes the cornerstone of inclusive city and city planning and, and, and governance. That's the key message that we must carry um, to, to the decision makers and the designer uh, of participation. So let me stop here and uh, be happy to take up a couple of questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Costa, uh, for your insightful presentation. Um, and especially because you have comprehensively highlighted um, the hows and what's of uh, participatory planning and how social inclusion and participatory planning of cities uh, can be enabled to build more inclusive and accessible uh, cities which resonate with the voices and uh, uh, agency of the vulnerable. Um, and I would like to just uh, take a few more minutes uh, to raise some of the questions that we have from the audience today. Uh, if you could address those, sir, and I will just uh, take the first question. Uh, the first question is about uh, discussing uh, about uh, learning or inclusion of vulnerable groups within participatory planning. How do we effectively build on evidence-based measuring and learning, uh, especially when problem statements are conceptualized uh, to uh, talk about the challenges faced by communities and targeted audiences? So the question is, how do we measure uh, the learnings and incorporate evidence-based measuring and learning uh, and formulate problem statements to highlight the uh, problems faced by communities and targeted audiences. Over to you, sir. Well, I guess, um, uh, you know, it's not only uh, one, one thing is that um, many times we focus on uh, individual participation, um, but particularly for the marginalized groups, whether marginalization happens uh, on the basis of gender, on the basis of caste, on the basis of uh, um, you know, their social uh, background or economic background. There could be various sort of factors for marginalization. We have to go back to the, to the core of it. And uh, wherever participation has transformed the power relationship, uh, the collectivization and mobilization of those groups are critically important. And the very process of collectivization is a learning process. And, and then the benefit is that they not only share the problem that they are facing, 
but they also provide solutions. And, and they would suggest solutions. Very creative solutions would come from the uh, citizens. Um, not only that, once they see that there is a, there is a possibility of uh, authentic partnership between public authorities, uh, you know, whether it is, uh, or, or, or civil society organizations or NGOs or other citizens groups, um, they, they would sort of own uh, the responsibility for implementing, uh, implementation of those solutions. So, so the, the measurement is not, it's, it's a more like a progress indicator that people are mobilized, they are sharing their ideas, it's not only problem, but also they are you know, providing solutions and they are taking or, or, or taking co-responsibility to, to implement those solutions. So you can, you, you can measure it. You can measure it. Rightly put, sir, uh, we can definitely measure uh, some of the challenges and effectively conceptualize what uh, and come up with solutions for tackling the challenges of the communities. The other question that has come through is uh, with regards to the percolation of participatory planning within cities. Uh, how does uh, how do we combine issues, challenges faced by multiple stakeholders within the ambit of planning? And uh, how do we uh, translate it into designing and creating inclusive cities? Uh, so I understand from the question that it is about handling multiple voices and uh, challenges at the same time and how it can be combined into planning and designing creative inclusive cities. Over to you, sir. I guess we need to take, a, take an ecosystem approach here. You know, it's not, um, uh, even if you um, write a good manual on participatory planning, uh, there is no guarantee that the manual will be uh, followed um, in, in, in letter and spirit. So those who are facilitating participation, they also need to be trained uh, and believe, they must believe in participation. Um, so unless there is, unless there is uh, a kind of commitment that um, we are here to facilitate people's voices, uh, bringing out best out of these processes, uh, both in terms of voicing out the, uh, the, the, the aspiration of the people, but also how people can contribute to the solu uh, in, the, in the solution of those uh, problems. Um, but uh, the first thing first is to map the diversity within a city and, and see the range of vulnerability uh, that different social group might have. Uh, and therefore prioritizing that whose participation is critical. Uh, and, and if it is a kind of you know, public uh, uh, planning process, then whose priorities must be uh, taken into consideration and, 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 and be given better weightage. Um, so, so um, but, but that does not take away the right to participate by other stakeholders group. Um, so each stakeholder group has a, has a stake, interest, and therefore planning has to take that into consideration. But having, uh, it's, it's sort of easier said than done because many a times the, 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 uh, the skill for facilitating multiple interests and, and many a times diverse interests, many a times conflicting interests, um, those need to be uh, those need to be inculcated, developed within the city. You know, it cannot be imported from Delhi to uh, a kind of remote city. Uh, it has to be developed there. And therefore, uh, an ecosystem approach is uh, important. Uh, what I mean, meant by that, you know, even the urban planners who are trained in the, in the urban schools, uh, they must be trained in uh, those kind of facilitation. The municipal officials, the elected representatives, local civil society groups, other officials, um, you know, academic institutions, um, all need to you need to learn work together. Uh, you know, so 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 it 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 would it would be a kind of process oriented, learning oriented, co-creation uh, uh, work. 
otherwise uh, you know the, the, the other processes are very short uh, short term uh, and it, it doesn't sort of bring transformational change the, the the process might take longer but the subsequent processes will be much faster and sustainable and inclusive so much sir for your response to those two questions uh, and thank you so much especially for taking out your valuable time sir and i would like to thank you for the presentation you made today you have managed to effectively address various pertinent aspects and uh, addressing the need and ways that we are able to achieve uh, inclusivity and urban development through participatory planning on behalf of the icc at niu i would like to thank you for taking out your time and sharing your valuable thoughts and uh, it's been wonderful to hear from you sir and it is a pleasure to listen to your uh, thoughts on the subject we look forward to more collaborations on such important subjects of inclusive development in the near future uh, and before we close the session i would like to remind our audience that the lecture is part of the lecture series and can be accessed on the national urban learning platform and niu tv which is niu's youtube page uh, the link and the question for from today's session have been provided in the description box uh, would request all the audience members to access those thank you so much uh, and goodbye thank you it was a pleasure